As night fell on May 9, 1846, a week of conflict north of the Rio Grande came to an end. Two armies, one Mexican and one American, had fought for control of the territory north of that river. Sharp skirmishes, sieges of forts, and two massive battles had defined th this conflict. These were the opening battles of what was to be known as the Mexican-American War by American historians and the U.S. intervention in Mexico by Mexican historians. What brought war to the Rio Grande? What were the armies of Mexico and America like? What was this initial campaign, and how did it set the stage for the rest of the war that would follow and change the course of history? In 1844, Mexico was a nation crippled by debt and bankruptcy and decided to stop paying their debt to American banks. Mexican presidents were constantly in fear of being ousted by ambitious generals. The only thing Mexican and politicians could agree on was that Texas was a rogue state, that they refused to accept its independence, rejected the treaties that had been coerced from a captive Santa Ana in exchange for his life, and vowed to reconquer it once they were in a good position. In that same year, James K. Polk won the U.S. presidential election, winning 62% of the Electoral College. A firm believer in Manifest Destiny, which said the U.S. should expand from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, he immediately signed the annexation of the Texas Republic, whose application for admittance to the Union had divided U.S. politics as the admittance of a slave-owning nation would disrupt the delicate balance between the free and slave states. Mexico's reaction was to decry it as a legal act, and the two sides prepared for war. Polk tried diplomacy, but thinking he might need force, put together a small U.S. regular army and sent it to Texas under Zachary Taylor to enforce the territorial claims and put pressure on Mexico during the negotiations. Even as the United States advanced troops into Texas, Mexican President Jose Joaquin de Herrera was removed by coup on rumors of treason and his successor, Mariano Paredes, was most eager for the chance to allow the Mexican army to go fight against the United States. In 1846, the American public was very critical of a regular army, preferring militias, and the United States Army was under strength at a mere 5,300 men. Not only were they under strength, the U.S. Army had not fought a major war since the early months of 1815. Politically, it was under attack. With a bill being debated to abolish West Point, which was seen as elitist. However, the equipment of these soldiers was in good condition. Their artillery was state of the art, and their training was favorable to those of the European armies, according to foreign veterans who served in their ranks. Their officer corps was trained at West Point in the newest methods of warfare. The political attacks on the military helped give a drive to the men and officers to do well and prove they were necessary. The last major advantage was that their commander, General Zachary Taylor was willing to listen to the advice of other officers. The Mexican Army of 1846 was the largest standing army in North America with over 30,000 men. They were also highly experienced in large-scale warfare with such recent wars as the 1836 Texas Revolution and 1840 insurrection of the breakaway Republic of the Rio Bravo. Only the ambition of army generals that kept Mexico from creating the National Guard as Mexico embraced their military full-heartedly. Their weakness, however, was many. The Mexican troops were generally conscripts who served terms of one year. The complete lack of industry forced Mexico to use artillery that dated from the days of the Spanish Empire and purchased muskets that were outdated from Great Britain. The latter were in such poor condition that only double charges of powder would give them range, but this caused a recoil that threw off aid, broke shoulders, and forcibly pushed the firing soldier back. Poor pay and lack of food caused several mutinies among the army, even as it was marching north to fight the Americans, which had to be put down. Perhaps the greatest weakness was that the generals were divided, with the commander, Mariano Arista, and the second command, Pedro Ampudia, bickering with each other and dividing the army's loyalties amongst themselves. These two armies glared at each other for months across the Rio Grande, until on April 25th, when Arista believed his Mexican army was strong enough to strike. The first engagement was a rousing success for the Mexicans, as they trapped a unit of U.S. dragoons and overwhelmed them, and even returned wounded prisoners to the U.S. Army when their facilities couldn't handle them. The next week was spent maneuvering by the two armies, with the U.S. Army, already small, having detached men to defend positions, such as 500 men to defend a fort that could and did start shelling the Mexican city of Metamoros, on the south bank of the Rio Grande, in an attempt to burn it down and divert Mexican attention away from the fort, and 100 men to defend the supply 
Depot at Port Isabel on the Texas coast. When the two main armies did join, Zachary Taylor had less than 2,300 men to face off against Arista's more than 3,700 men. They met at the watering holes of Palo Alto on May 8th. Arista blocked Taylor and hoped he would launch an infantry charge that his much larger forces, despite their poor equipment, could easily shred to pieces, while their far superior cavalry forces would be able to sweep in and neutralize the American artillery, which he had prioritized as a real danger posed by the Americans. Taylor nearly obliged, but his willingness to listen to his officers stopped him, and he settled upon using his artillery. The American artillery fired extremely accurate fire, while the Mexican artillery did not have the range and constantly missed. The few hits the Mexican scored were shots that rebounded off the ground, flew over the head of the American cannon, and landed among the infantry far behind. Arresta, desperate to turn things around, ordered his cavalry to charge, but it took two hours and four separate orders to get his cavalry to move, and the last one was delivered personally by him. The cavalry became bogged down in swampy ground, and instead of their elite lancers, the lead soldiers fought as if they were fighting Comanches. By the time the cavalry did hit, the U.S. infantry had deployed squares and thwarted the attacks. The fire was so intense that the grass between the two armies caught fire. Only once during the battle did the U.S. regulars launch their own attack, but a combination of mass cavalry and extremely severe Mexican fire caused them immediately to break off, with some men seriously wounded. Nightfall ended the battle, and the Mexican forces, having suffered heavy losses, decided to retreat under the cover of darkness. The U.S. Army pursued the next day, and several miles south, they caught the Mexican army. The Mexicans had deployed in the heavy undergrowth at Resaca de la Palma, abandoned the waterway of the Rio Grande Delta. Arista had hoped that the cover would allow his men to fend off the Americans. Taylor, upon catching up to the Mexicans, didn't even form a battle strategy, sending regiments in one at a time piecemeal as soon as they arrived. The heavy undergrowth that did indeed help shield the Mexicans from the murderous American fire, but the American artillery still managed to knock out Mexican guns and inflate the Mexican positions. American troops were able to get close to the Mexicans who couldn't see them through the thick brush, and fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat broke out. One Mexican general, Romola Diaz de la Vega, was captured by being shoved between the barrel and the wheel of a cannon he was trying to fire. The savage battle quickly turned into a rout for the Mexicans, despite having an even larger army of 4,000 men in this battle, and the U.S. having an even smaller force of 1,600 troops, Arista's forces fled and quickly abandoned the north side of the Rio Grande River. Not only did they withdraw from these battles, but they also broke off all operations north of the Rio Grande, such as the week-long siege of what was to be called Fort Brown, named after one of the few defenders who was killed. The battlefield casualties alone testified of just how handily the U.S. had won. Only 60 Americans were dead, and only 149 wounded. Mexico, however, lost 335 killed and 336 wounded, or three times what the Americans lost. Unlike, there are many impacts of this campaign. For Mexico, never again did Mexican troops operate north of the Rio Grande. Mexican troops were seized with terror of the U.S. soldiers, and as the war progressed, even U.S. militia units would lead to garrisons abandoning their posts. Mexican generals lost confidence and vacillated in how they would respond to U.S. military forces with disastrous consequences. In the U.S., the idea of war had been received lukewarm, yet after these victories, the war became popular and politicians opposed the war, like young Abraham Lincoln, saw their political career stunted. The U.S. troops came away with greater confidence, believing they defeated twice the amount of Mexican troops that were actually in combat, which ironically was what Arista had convinced him was the case. These victories allowed the United States to have a base to launch invasions in central Mexico, which would eventually lead to U.S. victory at the end of the war. These battles may be small, but they are indeed very important to us today. General Arista would become president of Mexico. General Taylor would become president of the U.S. in 1848 and made California state. One of the officers of the U.S. Army was Ulysses S. Grant, who would use the knowledge from his battlefield experiences to help win the American Civil War. These U.S. victories, due to an entirely regular army, saved West Point, which was never threatened again with being abolished. The United States regular army gave new power respect that carries to this very day and was never again so small. The battles and the overall victory of the U.S. over Mexico during the war created the Mexican perception of Americans as arrogant and violent, while it created a sense of the superiority of Americans over Mexicans. Lastly, these battles set in blood where our modern U.S.-Mexico border is located in Texas.